Hello, there's somebody else over there I know. <laughs> Hello Kay. <laughs> we <Well>, say something. <laughs> Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard Hall and this is our, our night sky at the moment. Uh, there you are, look at that. We can see the stars for a moment now. Okay, so, um, well, this is actually a very special day if you didn't know it. So it's actually um, the equinox today. Yes, and out at Stonehenge, because it's the equinox, we always put a, a special program on the equinoxes. Now, the equinoxes and solstices, most people are not aware of this, but just about every major religious event around the world, yeah. from culture to culture, religion to religion, is identified with a solstice or an equinox. And this is because these days were important to people, not just going back a centuries in time, but going back thousands upon thousands of years in time. They had special meaning. So we've got a special program coming up tonight at Stonehenge. Uh, it starts at 6.30, all right? And um, what we're going to do is I've got a special presentation on the autumn equinox, but also looking at the, the other equinoxes and solstices in brief, but particularly concentrating on the, the fall other seasons um, and then that's going to uh, conclude with taking people out to the henge we've got some live music organized Keith yep. yes we've got some live music organized as well and uh, hopefully if it's if it's nice uh, we'll be able to see the sunset at the Stonehenge as well and then pick out the stars for you as well so that's what we've got coming up anything like to add to that Kay I think the most dramatic um sunset i saw out there for one of our events was when the sky was really black and stormy over towards the hills mm. and there was a band of clear just above the hills mm. and the sun set in that it was just intensely dramatic because of the contrast yeah yeah well um <clears throat> so that's it so that's starting up now. Uh, for those of you watching this on TV, there are a few images coming up, uh, <laughs> which you might recognise from different things. Even the lovely lady on the end there doing uh, the, the strip tease, as it were, the Dance of the Seven Vows. You may not realise this, but it actually the Dance of the Seven Vows also plays an important role in the foundations of world religions and so on. Is that Jen? Hey, That's not Jen, is it? No, that's not Jen, that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, and then, of course, uh, we'll be also be looking at that, um, that nasty little fellow, the, the Irishman that goes around with his lantern. So we'll be checking out all those things fairly soon, tonight, actually. Remember, 6.30 is our start time. Uh, and if you want to come along, you can always give us a call or phone up Kay and she'll book you in. Anyway, looking at our, now for the first time, looking at our um, autumn night sky. Look into the south, and incidentally, when I say look at the night sky, the night sky, of course, is changing very slowly all the time. If you go out early in the evening, you're still going to see the old summer stars arrive, but come the evening, uh, the stars I'm showing you now is what you're going to see around about getting close towards midnight, all right? This is when the point of everything changes. And looking south, at the beginning of the uh, equinox at midnight the southern cross comes to it virtually its highest point in the sky and you can see that up there at the moment there there it is there the southern cross comes almost overhead All right so that's a, also a great clock in the sky that people have been using for thousands of years but this is the turning point in the seasons looking over to the west we see orion which is heading down towards the horizon which is setting now orion is our sign of summer now right? So when Orion is in the sky, it's summer. You've got to remember all these things I'm telling you, if you lived in the Northern Hemisphere, where it all started from, it's the reverse. It's the other way around. That's right. Orion was a sign of winter back in, in Europe and so on. But of course, rising up, we've got the scorpion. Now the scorpion is our, is our sign of winter and it's going to dominate the night sky uh, over the winter period. So there's the, the scorpion coming up there. Okay, uh, now looking round to the north, because the, the Milky Way has moved away, uh, we're looking at, uh, well, compared to some evenings, night skies, sort of more, looks a bit more barren. You haven't got the big, brilliant Milky Way there. But we've actually got so lots of interesting stars, and almost due north, I don't know if you can pick it out now, what those of you watch on TV, is the um, sickle. There it is there. 
the sickle. And you see, this star was in, these group of stars were important because if we go back a few thousand years, back in Europe, the rising of these stars said it was time to bring in the harvest, okay? <laughs> And that's what it was all about. So people knew when, to, when it was time to carry out the harvest, when everyone had to gather together, to this, this thing, uh, was to when those stars rose up. But it wasn't just when those stars rose up, it was also the moon, all right? It's not very long ago. Mm. I remember my mother talking about yeah. um, events on the farms where everybody had to come together, yeah. all the relatives, and help with the harvest. That's that's not very long ago. No, it's not. No, it's not. Mm. I mean, it's something we sort of miss, I think, in our modern day in life. But a lot of people, things people used to do is everyone would get together to carry out certain things. Well, they didn't know. have the great big machines they've got now. No, no, mm. that's right. Now, the bright star on the handle of the sickle is Regulus, right? And it's rather an interesting star itself. It's just over 77 light years away. And if you could get up close to it, uh, you would find that instead of being nice and uh, spherical like our sun, it's ellipsoid in shape. That's due to its rapid rotation. However, you probably wouldn't be able to get that close to it because it's actually 150 times brighter than the sun. And it, it's hot, white hot as well. Okay? So because it's spinning so fast, it's developed that football shape. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. As a, to, for those of us, it goes up. It's got its, its rotation. It rotates on its axis in just under sixteen hours. And you've got to remember that the sun takes twenty-seven days to rotate once. Yes. So this thing, as a star, is really spinning round. So it's throwing all the equatorial stuff out. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it has that peculiar yeah. football shape to it. But also, um, Regulus is not a single star. Our sun is a single star, right? But a lot of the stars we see up there, they've actually got companion stars, and Regulus is actually part of a system. I think it's about four stars in total, okay? So quite close to um, Regulus, and actually the little yellow ball that's just come up, uh, it's actually showing you our sun to scale, if we put it next to Regulus, all right? Anyway, um, it's a system of four stars. And just down here is a, its, it's com closest companion orbits around it in a period of 40 days. Now, folks, you're not going to see this in a telescope or anything. You need really big telescopes to actually see these things, all right? And what we do know, and uh, this is a, some image uh, stuff that's come from the uh, James Webb Telescope, what they discovered is that there's a bridge of matter between the two stars, and essentially the big one, Regulus, is gobbling up its companion, gradually drawing matter from it and so on. So that's what it would look like if you could actually see it close like up. Like a stellar vacuum cleaner. Yes, S exactly. Sucking stuff off. The and then further away, all right, is a binary system, all right? And its distance is 4,200 astronomical units. Now, if you don't know what astronomical unit is, it's the distance between the Earth and the Sun, all right? Which is about 150 million kilometres, all right? So the distance between... The, the stars from, uh, from Regulus is 4,200 times greater than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Okay, but the interesting, these, these are dwarf stars that we have here, okay? In fact, the brighter of the two is very similar to our own Sun. Mm. And orbiting around it is a red dwarf star. Now, for, <clears throat> don't think, oh, well, there were, may well be planets around all these stars, there's going to be nobody there looking out at us because we know the very fact that Regulus itself is a, uh, is a giant star is actually very, very young, right? Yeah. So it's, it's only a few hundred million years old, right? So if life could evolve on a planet, it's only, it's only just got underway now. Certainly wouldn't be people out there, as it were. And also, of course, Regulus will be putting out a huge amount of heat and a huge amount of ultraviolet. UV, yes. Yeah, it's not very conductive. To, you want to steer away from these things. And not only that, when Regulus dies, it could die in a rather violent manner as well. Yeah. So that's Regulus there, OK? And then we can see, once again, you can see the sickle come up. And the sickle is part of Leo the lion, all right? So it's actually part of the mane of the lion.
and just below, down below the, the, the lion, if you've got a pair of binoculars, you just look down there and you'll see what appears to be a little sprinkling of stars. And what we've got here is a magnificent star cluster, right? This is known as the Presepi, which means the beehive. And it's a cluster of about 50 baby stars and its distance is 520 light years away. So in other words, we're seeing it as it was 520 years ago in our time. Yeah. Why do they look so blue? Well, it says this, it says a cluster, fits it. always the stars that stand out tend to be the hotter and bigger stars. And the bigger and hotter star is, is when it's formed, the more blue its light is. So stars more massive than our sun will be white or blue-white, as you can see them there. All right. Then stars that are uh, cooler or smaller will be uh, orangey or red. You can't actually see the orangey red if you look you at You can that, see a few, can't you? You can see a few orange stars there. But at they're, least they're foreground stars. Uh, they're red giants. Oh. They're stars that are already, already evolving away from they were would have been they were bigger again once. they were, would have been originally the very bright blue white stars in there and yeah. they're turning into red giants that's going to happen to our sun one day our sun will turn into a red giant as it begins to age yeah mm. it's so, very but, pretty it is it's beautiful to look at in, in the in the telescope yeah so it's well well worth having a look at yeah and that's the beehive cluster the beehive cluster yeah okay so looking at the big bright stars that we got we got regulus um and then to the left setting in the west we got procyon and sirius the two great dog stars which are local stars but following behind regulus we have arcturus all right and arcturus is a red giant it's one of those stars that has evolved all right and even with the regulus is i think it's the fourth brightest star in the sky <clears throat> and if you're looking at it even with the unaided eye and from a dark sky site, you can definitely see it's got an orangey yellow colour. Okay. Now, something important about here is Arcturus is part of the the bee key, the bear keeper. Right? Yeah. You didn't know we had bear keepers, did you? Mm, he doesn't look very friendly. He's holding a sickle. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. He's, holding, he's, he's not going to be very nice to the bear, <laughs> is he? <laughs> No, but this is how this is people, it was also important at that time. You see, um, Arcturus is the brightest star, it's actually on the knee actually, of Boates, right? And it, Boates drives the, the bear around the North Pole, right? Ursa Major, the great bear. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, from here, only a little bit of the bear can be seen, right? Of course, if you, if you, if you were back in Europe and that you, you'd pick these things out no problem at all a bit like the Southern Cross right so from New Zealand he can barely be seen he can barely oh, be seen. well done <laughs> I think <laughs> so you just see the feet of the bear come up and part of boat is following behind driving the bear around the uh, around the pole and of course the, the beautiful thing about the, the stars of the bear that also contains the plough which I'm afraid does not rise from here but it's a bit for people who live in the northern hemisphere it's a bit like the southern cross mm. because you can use the plough to identify Polaris which is the north star and that gives you your north and your latitude. direction north that's right and your latitude same way as we use the, the southern cross for much the same thing so there you are so that's what Arcturus is there now if you could have a look at it there I just put, put, no, well, I'm showing you these pictures here from a surface. You've got to remember they're, they're made up, right? <laughs> On based upon the knowledge that we got, because we're not actually taking photographs of it. And as it says there, Arcturus, the fourth brightest star in the sky, all right? It's 170 times brighter than the sun, but its mass is only 10% greater. Mm. And this tells you that it's relatively young, like it's it's similar to the age of the sun but it's because it's slightly more massive it's evolved further all right so once upon a time arcturus would be more like the sun right maybe a little bit it would have been a little bit brighter but not considerably so and it's aging now and it's expanded its diameter has expanded to 26 times that of the sun so right? once again when you have a sun-like star it um our sun at the moment it's a nice stable star in its middle age but as it gets older, it's going to start expanding. 
Yeah. The atmosphere of the star is going to expand outwards and it's going to change from a nice bright yellow colour to a dull red colour. Yeah. And this is what we call a red giant. Yeah, that's right. And of course, being being bright, these stars will stand out. All right. Mm. So you're in the night sky, you can often pick them out. All right. Now, looking at our sun to scale, all right, I'm bringing it up now. <laughs> well, that's what the sun look, it would be if you placed it alongside. The sun is basically a <clears throat> dot by comparison. Yeah. But remember that... <clears throat> It not looks like a planet. Not it? so long ago, Arcturus wouldn't have been much bigger and brighter than that. Well, so that gives you an indication of what's going to happen to our sun in the future. Don't worry, it's not going to be happening tomorrow. Uh, we, we, <laughs> the sun's about halfway through its life expectancy, so we've got a few more billion years to go. But as you can see, when that happens, uh, and, well, I'm afraid there won't be much left of the Earth there, because as it grows... It'll engulf the Earth. As it says, they're 170 times brighter. Well, the atmosphere of the planet, planet Earth will be driven off into space and the surface of the Earth will glow red hot, probably Mushrooms molten. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, Arcturus, <laughs> not a very nice place to go. Anyway, uh, before we go on, I think we should have a bit of a break now. And... Um, the young fellow over here has brought along a flute, and I didn't know he played a flute. So, and you said to me, you're going to play us a tune today. I play a few instruments, yes. yes. I'm still learning. This is, um, this is an Irish flute, and I know we're a few days late, but um, I'm wearing green. St. Pat. Hmm. Uh, as you can, yeah, hello, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, this is a um, celebration of St. Patrick's Day, but this is a... This is uh, flutes. Um, in the musical world, flutes are amazing instruments. You find them everywhere in every musical cult in every culture. Yeah. You find some kind of uh, some kind of wind instrument like a flute. They're very simple, just a tube with holes. Um, you got a thing called a fipple or a slot, which uh, splits the airstream, and that's what generates the sound. But um, on this particular flute, I wrote a, a piece of music. Uh, which is actually for a, um, uh, a movie a pre about prehistoric life. Okay. And um, so it um, it's actually supposed to be accompanied by an orchestra. But anyway, yeah. it, is, it, is Kay going to sing to this? Yeah. yeah you, you're singing the lead <laughs> to it, yeah. The camera's pointing at you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There you go. <laughs> and as you're looking at, looking at a flute, actually, you said the oldest instruments we know of, 
the probably there would probably have been like a cane, wouldn't they, or something like that? Well, the um, oldest musical instrument that has been found grass. has been dated to 11,000 years ago. Is that right? And it's a flute made from the uh, antler of a deer, um, and it's still playable. Oh, right. And it plays on the um, Phrygian scale, which is the E scale on the piano keyboard. And it's 11,000 years old and still playable. Wow, wow. I always love those sorts of things because uh, when you, uh, I always imagine the person who actually made that or sitting playing it and so on. Yeah, yes. It takes you back in time, doesn't it? It does. Anyway, returning to our stars, above Arcturus you'll see coming up is the bright star Spica. And in contrast to Arcturus, we've got another, which is a red, reddish orange star. Spica is another blue white star. All right? And um, it truly is, that's actually a photograph of Spica taken through there. That's and, an actual photograph. Yeah, that, that last one was an actual photograph. And what we do know is that um, of, of those stars we've been looking at, Spica's the brightest. It's 260 light years away. <clears throat> and uh, it's pumping out energy at a rate of 13,400 suns, all right? And it's a very young star as well. But first thing we notice, well, we can't see this in a telescope, but we can pick it up with instruments, that is a binary star system with two stars very close together, orbiting around each other, and matter has been transferred from one to the other, and then often jetted out into space. And that's for the, you watch it on TV, you can see this material that's been jetted out from, from Spica. And there you are, that's what we think of you up closely would be looking like, right? Gradually tearing each other apart. Yes, they're very close together. Yes, they are. What we call contact binary sisters. Mm. Are they going to end up merging? Probably not. They could do. If they did, it would probably be a mighty explosion if they did that. Yeah. But often what's happening is they're ripping material off. Some of it's been transferred from the smaller star to the bigger star. In other words, it's cannibalizing it. But then often in that process, as we saw, there's a lot of material being injected out into space. So mm. it's lo losing a lot of... And again, this is all powered by gravity. Yes, that's right. OK. And Spica is the ear of wheat held by Virgo. So it's the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo. Which, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's... It would be looking at it as saying, oh, this is spring coming up. Virgo is coming to, she's the great goddess that brings fertility to the land. And But for us, of course, it's a sign of winter coming. So it's our autumn stars. Now, I said a bit earlier that looking out there, it doesn't seem as brilliant because it's away from the Milky Way. But in fact, actually, because it were away from the Milky Way, not only is there lots of stars in the Milky Way, there's dust and gas. Mm. And we look, look away from that. This, this, this is gas and dust blots out the light of faint, uh, more distant objects. But in the Virgo, because we're looking away from the Milky Way, we've got this window out into the greater universe. And centred, take it 60 million light years away, right? is this gigantic cluster of galaxies. So not just our galaxy, but thousands of other galaxies out there. And it's centered 60 million light years away. And for those of you looking at this on TV, the brighter areas show where things are concentrated. Again, notice it's a big ellipsoidal shape. And in the outer region, we've got lots of spiral galaxies similar to the our Milky Way galaxy, right? Is that the Whirlpool galaxy on the top right? Yeah, yeah, these are all, these are all, because this Virgo cluster is relatively close to us compared with our clusters. Yes, we can see this quite easily with telescopes. But just bear in mind that um, if somebody's out there looking down here, even if they had the technology to see the Earth, what they would be seeing at the Earth was 60 million 60 years ago. Million There's a good years. chance they might see some dinosaurs, who knows? Yeah. Oh, maybe the asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> it hits them, yeah, that's right. 
You always got to remember is that the further we go into space, the further back was in time we look. So they would be looking at us, and they'll be they'll be seeing um, Apatosaurus and Diplodocus. Yeah. And T Rexes um, yeah. attacking Velociraptors. Well, not only that, Keith. If you look at those beautiful photographs that have been taken of those galaxies, we're seeing those galaxies as they were 60 million, million years, years ago, yes. on average. Yeah. That always gets me. That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're seeing the past. So, of course, out there now, there could be lots of civilizations of intelligent beings behind worlds, but. Yeah, I get people who, who come into the hinge and say to me, well, how do you know that what the galaxies look like then? Well, it's quite simple. You take a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, of course, the other thing, folks, I see, I've mentioned this many times before, what you're looking at there is, is in a galaxy is a cluster of you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of stars, often where the light is just merging together. And each of those those is, our sun is a star, right? Mm. And we believe from our, what we've known about how we've theorised how stars form, that planets were a natural byproduct of that. That was a theory, right? Mm. But now that's changing. We've now, with the James Webb Telescope, got the technology to detect it, and now we've already discovered thousands of planets beyond the solar system. So the numbers of planets just in our own solar, solar it's galaxy will run into the hundreds of millions. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of millions rather okay and that's just one galaxy right so the outer all the galaxies in the outer region of the virgo cluster they're all spiral the big ones are all big spiral galaxies but when we look in closer towards the center we find that they're all elliptical galaxies elliptical they don't have spiral arms and what it is, is the density is there. And what's happening is the galaxies are actually colliding and absorbing each other, right? Now, the biggest one is M87. I know it's not expected. There it is. I brought it up there, okay? It's a titanic galaxy. M87 is an elliptical galaxy. It, it's an elliptical, spherical, elliptical in shape, no spiral arms. And this is because these things are grown by simply absorbing other galaxies in a violent process. And you can see close to it, a couple of other galaxies are probably getting too close, are probably going to be absorbed. That one there mm. is our galaxy to scale. Mm. Yeah. It's right. a bit like the Magellanic clouds coming into us. That's right, yeah, mm. yeah. And I'll tell you what, this, this galaxy, I've, seen, I've looked at it many, many times in a telescope. It's quite spectacular. It's your phone, dear. Okay. We've got the autumn equinox coming up. Kay, would you like to say a few words? Not really. <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> You're the one who put this together and put yeah. what's on it. I I think um, we will accept people who do turn up, but we do recommend that you book. Yeah. One of the reasons for booking and leaving both your email and your phone number is that I can stay in contact with you about the weather. Yeah. Okay, and <laughs> with the weather these days is so unpredictable. You can have a forecast for... Um, you know, high winds and uh, stormy conditions, and we can be sitting in sun, mm. or it's quite calm there and not a problem at all. So you do need to um, to contact, or I'll contact you if there's any kind of problem that's well, the rising. Not looking too bad, is it? No, it actually looks pretty good. The forecast says, um, you know, a, a wind a wind warning for lower lower wire wrapper and Wellington, but um, we had some pretty good winds at the beginning of last night and quite a bit of rain, but it's only sort of greyish at the moment. And, it, and it, if you're new to this subject, you're actually going to be amazed at some of the things where our traditions and, that, and things that we... Yeah, I think the on. fascinating thing is a lot of these things go back so far. You just... And that's only as far as we can track them. You know, they go further than that, that we, we haven't got any... Any written, written records that we can actually understand particularly well. They're probably there. They're probably even on cave drawings, but we don't know how to interpret them, and so we're not getting the message. Yeah. And other, there's other civilizations that have come and gone and left bits of information that we basically haven't got a handle on yet. 
So it probably goes back a long, long way. And when you've got a good story, that story doesn't get lost. It no. just gets transformed oh, over the yeah. years yeah. and it just keeps on going. Yeah, right. and it goes through so all sorts of, of different of religions and cultures. Yeah. yeah, Lots of interesting things for you to discover tonight. It's fascinating. Now, hopefully, if the sky is clear, we'll go out and we can look at the night sky as well. Anyway, we have to shut up now. We've run out of time. Okay, and uh, Stonehenge is open. Or oh, not today? No, Wednesday through to Sunday. Monday and Tuesday yeah. is our day off. Private right? private tours can be out of ours. Okay, so but they have to be booked. You can't just turn up. Okay, folks, we'll catch up with you again soon. Catch you later. Bye. <laughs>